Good morning. Reading in God's Word today is in Romans 13, 11 through 14. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come, for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as it is daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or democracy, not in decision or jealousy. Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So be it. start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come to this place and worship you. And not that only that can we can come to this place and worship you, but we have the freedom to worship you wherever in this country without persecution that so many in the church these days and for the past, since the beginning of time, have, have suffered for being your people, for sharing the word of Jesus Christ, for sharing their faith. Lord, help us to be bold about sharing our faith, especially when we don't have those issues and those problems and we see the glories that you give us, Lord, to have the freedoms that you have. Help us to not take lightly this great salvation, but to take every opportunity that we have to cherish and say to ourselves that Jesus Christ is enough, that he, that he died for me. We just thank you and praise you. Open up our hearts and minds to hear your word and apply them to our lives so that we may be a light to this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's more devotionals down here if you don't have one, and if you haven't been reading along, I thought I would share a little bit of one with you as I started. This one is from the 20th, and it's called Numbering Our Days. Imagine a bank creditor, a bank crediting their account with $86,400 each morning. That's the number of seconds that you have in any given day. The account can't carry over any balance from day to day, and it deletes whatever remains at the end of the day. What would you do? No, duh. Take that money out, spend it, use it. So what are you doing with what God has given you each and every day, with the breath that He's given you, the talent that He has given you, and so much more the good news of Jesus Christ? Is Jesus enough for you? Is it what motivates you to live this new life that you have, being born again? We do have such a bank. It is called time, 86,400 seconds each day. In Psalms 90, Moses reminds us that light, in light of the brevity of our human existence and the etern, eternally, eternality of God, see, he struggles with some of them, to, to number our days rightly so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. But our, in our busy culture, sometimes we get preoccupied with living for the moment. We have, if we have no answer to death, then that makes sense. But we have an answer to death. We know that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he rose again. We have an answer to death. So then our lives should be ones that trust in God's atonement and care for us. So number your days rightly. Be as determined to avoid wasting time in this life as if you avoid squandering money in your bank account. Make each and every second count for Christ. Is that how we live our lives? Or do we get complacent in this world? It's easy to do. If, and I think about this as I'm reading through a lot of the scripture. If we're not really suffering, because I have to think about how I am suffering for Jesus. When I walk out that door, I don't fear that someone is going to come and throw me in prison and crucify me. 
for my faith. I can go out freely and proclaim the love of Jesus Christ. I can do good things. I can love others, even love my enemies. And I might get criticized a little bit. So if I'm not really suffering as I see people suffering other places, other times, for sharing God's Word, then why am I not sharing it more? Why does it not mean more to me? Why do I get absorbed in other things and do them more in my time, my talents, my money? And why do I even get complacent and not go out and do the things that God has called me to do, to be a light to this world? I've entitled this Daily Walk of Faith. How does your walk of faith look in spite of the persecutions? Because we read this week from Genesis chapter 36 to 50, and we read Romans chapter 12 through 16. So you finished up Genesis and you finished up Romans. You should have started Isaiah also and, and Mark. I didn't start them yet, which was yesterday, simply because I wanted to get focused on this, and I knew if I read that, then I'd be over the, all over the place too much. So I said, let me stop right here, and, and let's get through Genesis, and let's get through Romans. And how wonderful that was, reading those together. And if you are following along, here we are only whatever day today is, and you've already read Genesis, and you've already read Romans. Good job. And you should be excited, and you should have saw that it's not that hard to do. You probably didn't even have to take that much time out of your busy schedule. Isaac is now dead, and he's buried, and Jacob is in the land that God has promised him and his descendants, finally. Chapter 37 tells of the lineage of Esau. Why? <laughs> because God calls people to be his people in this world, and he doesn't call others. Okay. I don't know. I don't have the answers to all that. I know that the lineage is there so that I can see this history, so that I can see that the Bible is this historical, historical account. Genesis is the beginnings of mankind's civilization. But why does God call some and why does God not call others and pour His blessings out on them? I don't know. But what I do know is that God has called me. And I hope God has called you. And are you answering His calling? Or are we going off on the ways of the world, setting our eyes on Sodom and Gomorrah or other things? Or we, do we lack the faith that we have? Do we let sin so easily entangle us? Or are we listening to His calling? Are we reading His Word? Are we being a light in this world? Are we sharing Jesus Christ every opportunity that we get? Do you have faith then? That asks, makes me ask that question. Do you have hope? Do you have love? If you have those things, then in whom or what do you have those things in? Who do you put your faith in? Yourself, man? Or do you put your faith in God? And we see all this through this account of Genesis. Do you have hope? Do you have hope despite any situation that you know that you have eternal life, that God will not let one hair on your head be harmed unless it's in His will? Do you love? Do you love God and do you love others? as much as you love yourself. Even your enemies, because you love so much, because God loved you, that you even want your enemies to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I think Paul writes to the Corinthian church that without love, everything else you do is just noise. But out of these three, faith, hope, and love, Love is the one that is the greatest, the one that will endure, the one that is the reason that I breathe and live and exist to proclaim God's message now because He loved me so much that He gave His one and only Son for me. So as the song, the hymn words were that we read, that Jesus is enough for me because He died for me. In 1 Peter 1, we started that uh, in our Sunday school lesson last week. And I want to read you verses 13 through 22. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, let us set our hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He, called you, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy, since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially. Look out, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from this empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through Him you believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and glorified Him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have pure purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Peter writes these same things. He says, so that your faith and hope are in God and so that you are sincere in your love for each other. So I ask again, what does my life look like? You have to ask the question for yourself. What does my life look like to others in this world? Do I have faith? What is my faith resting upon? Do I have hope? Is it grounded in Jesus Christ? And do I have love for God and do I have love for others? So as I'm reading through Genesis, I'm like, boy. But I say also at the same time, I say, "Mm, look at my life. Forgive me, Father, for the things that I continue to do. Why do I continue to do the things that I choose not to do? Oh, praise God and thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ and how His Spirit is transforming me day in, day out to be like Christ in this world. Therefore, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It's your reasonable, the only thing that makes reason in your mind, it's your reasonable act of service, is to lay down your life to serve the one who gave his life for you. And you've got to pull yourself apart from this world so that the Holy Spirit can transform you from the inside out. Esau despised his birthright and sold it for a bowl of soup. So now you have Esau's lineage. And look what the world sees. They see Esau's lineage flourishing. Even the people of the children of Israel see Esau flourishing. But do they live much differently than Esau, who despises his birthright? Not much differently, do they? Jacob doesn't live much much differently. And certainly his sons don't because they follow after his pattern of half-hearted devotion to God. God made a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and he made it with Jacob and he keeps his word. And Esau did prosper. Abraham is having innumerable descendants but who is following after God? Who is trusting God? Who is putting their faith in God? I hope you see that Joseph's example is coming up. And boy, his story looks like it doesn't have much hope, does it? What is his faith grounded in? And does God really love him? Of course he does. Esau prospered even to the point of kings and kingdoms in this world. We fight this battle of who, what king we're going to serve. In fact, Israel, the nation of Israel, goes into captivity, but that's simply so that they can come out a mighty God. And as we read Exodus, which isn't yet, don't, don't go to Exodus next. You go to Isaiah and then Mark, follow the plan you'll see that God calls them out years later after they seem to be forgotten about again so that they can go out and worship Him for all the things that He's done. There are still a remnant. There's still a few people that really have the faith of Abraham. And we saw how that faith matured over time and we're seeing how Jacob's faith matured over time. The walk of faith is a journey. It is one of believing putting your trust in, and then acting upon and doing. It may look like the world has it made. And you may not see any difference in that in your lifetime. Or you might. But do you firmly believe in Jesus Christ, put your trust and faith in Him, and do you have the hope that He will return with you, your sins will be forgiven, and you will spend an eternity with God? If you do, how can you not have the love of God in your heart who first loved you? How can you not show it? Psalm 73, in verse 1, says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limit. 
They scoff and speak with malice and arrogance as they, as they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Could be a but right there instead. Therefore their, therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. Think about Revelation when the people of this world have been drunk upon the sins of Babylon and the things that they put their faith and their hope and their trust in and the things that they love. Skipping down to verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but you, though? And earth has nothing that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but my God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of your deeds. What a dramatic psalm. It starts out how the psalmist almost slips his footing because he looks at things of the world instead of keeping his spiritual focus on God and letting the Spirit dwell with his spirit and worship in spirit and in truth. The God who loves him and cares for him or her and will do everything to show that child how much that he, God loves them. Is that what you believe? Why are we tempted to envy others then? Especially worldly people. Why do, why, do, why do we yearn to know what makes them prosperous? What does it matter? For me to live is die, but to gain Christ is to gain everything. And when I pass from death to life, I spend eternity with Him, so death has no sting for me. Why would I worry about the things of this world? As God's children, what lies in your heart? What is your heart focused on? And therefore, where are your actions? Your mind can be confused, but if your heart is filled with God and His words are written on your heart and you walk in step with the Spirit, then yeah, you probably will still sin, but you'll sin less and less and less because your heart's desires are on things above, not on things of the earth. Are God's writ words written on your heart? that you might not sin against Him? Why do you get upset, not only when others prosper, but when they do things to you that harm you? Oh, the grudges that we hold. And they're not because somebody's taking it up and chaining us and beating us. They're because somebody probably said something about us. Oh, sticks and stones. Oh, wait a minute. We're not talking about sticks and stones. We're talking about words, aren't we? We're so, keep so many grudges in our heart again because somebody said something. Love covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? It's like pouring out heaping coals upon them because they can't understand why you love them when you should, in human earthly terms, hate them. But instead you love even your enemies because you were an enemy when Christ died for you. Why do you get angry and follow out on your anger then? Why don't you act instead of the love that's in your heart? Now maybe you don't do any of these things, but I do. That's why I wrote them down. Those are the things that I struggle with. So I have to go back and say I am a blessed child of God. I need to focus on heavenly things. I need to write His words on my heart. I need to not keep any grudges, any records of wrongs, but, but, but love is pure, faithful, and kind. And without love, all I'm doing is making noise. So walk by faith. Not like Esau did. And looks like he's prospering. Let's go on and look at another example. In Genesis 37, the focus turns to Joseph, the young son whom his brothers, brothers despised. And because God had complete control, they did not kill him, but they sold him into slavery instead. Well, that's a good break for Joseph, isn't it? That's in God's plan. And everything that we see in his dreams is going to come true, and we see why as we continue to read. And we see still the story of a faithless people somewhat, stiff-necked people, but now we're getting a, a man that honors God. And the whole time we get a story of a faithful, loving, righteous, holy God whom I want to serve. But I still struggle with this, 
this sin that still is in my heart and I need to get rid of it as I let the Holy Spirit transform me. God is in complete control. And Joseph is a man who walks by faith and he lives a life that shows it a life of integrity. He does come to rule over his brothers and he does in worldly terms look like he's flourishing. But then when you look closer, you see he doesn't do the things that the world does. So you're the First Peter 3.15 and you want to ask him a reason of the hope that's in him. Then Genesis 38 goes back to Judah. Okay, remember the birth order. Reuben's the firstborn. Oh, well, he slept with his father's concubine, didn't he? We read that back in chapter 35. Oh, Simeon was the secondborn, and Levi was the thirdborn. Oh, yeah, they're the ones that took the symbol of circumcision and used it to create a heinous murder in the town. They didn't care much about what identified them as a people, did they? Then we come to Judah, and he marries a Canaanite woman. You're not supposed to do that. He has sons, and God kills one of them because he's wicked. Then what happens to son number two? God kills him also. Wow. This family is messed up, and can't they see that God is in control? Judah sends his second son to his brother's widow and says, Give him an heir. But instead, he doesn't realize that children are heritage and blessing from the Lord. He doesn't want to follow his earthly father's commands, just like he doesn't want to follow his, uh, his heavenly father's hands. And instead of blessing the, the girl with an heir, he doesn't. He takes matters into his hand. And God kills him. So Judah tells the widow, Tamar, to go back home until son number three is grown. Now, in worldly points as a father, I understand Judah. I'm not going to give son number three because he's going to die also. Look at the pattern. But God has set standards that I'm supposed to follow. And he is supposed to marry this widow and give her an heir. It's the thing that he's supposed to do. But Judah has no intention of doing that. He has no intention because his heart isn't set on God. Years pass by, and Tamar takes matters into her own hands. She prettys herself up, puts some lipstick on, necklace on, clothes on, whatever she does, and sits by the road. And what does Judah do? Propositions her. What a man of God. And she says, well, wait a minute. What are you going to pay me? I'm going to give you a goat. <laughs> but you don't have a goat with you. What are you going to do? Well, I'll give you my signet ring, my identity again, and promise that I'll send the goat back. Well, then when he sends a servant out to take the goat back, they can't find her. Time passes. Finds out she's pregnant. What does Judah say then? We need to kill this harlot. What a sinner. And she pulls out the signet ring and says, Well, this is the man who made me pregnant. Wow, when we go to point fingers at other people for the sins that they do, when we still have sin that we're keeping instead of following the path of God. And Judah, at least he says, he says, she is more righteous than I. But what does he do with that? I mean, we sin, and that's not okay, but when we do sin, it should bring us to repentance and bring us back to a right relationship with God. That's why John wrote his letter before he died. He said, if you sin, confess your sins. And God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how can we let that hatred stay in our heart for our enemy? How can we be complacent about being the people that we're called to be? How can we love other things more than love God so we spend all of our time and money and effort doing this but don't do it in ministry for those in need? Ironically, Tamar gives birth to twins. And baby number two swaps places with baby number one, if you didn't read that, because they put a cord on his wrist, and then it goes back in, and the second one beats the first one out. Oh, the struggles of life continue. Where will this story go? 
Genesis chapter 39. Joseph, his name means God will give or God has added or God will increase. Oh, the very things that God promised Abraham when he made his original covenant with him. But it sure doesn't look like things are headed this way in this story, does it? But this is a story of God. His story, it's his story, his, his story, history as we know it. Because he is sovereign and in control of all things. And before you were ever even thought about, he knew you by your name. And then he knit you together in your mother's womb. And he called you to righteousness and holiness. A set apart child of God. A priest offering spiritual sacrifices. That means we, we do suffer somewhat. We do give up things because we offer spiritual sacrifices. And in a world where we're not being persecuted and burned at the stake or crucified, then that means maybe I need to give up some of the things that I treasure so much so that I can take care of others, so that I can proclaim the gospel message instead of building castles on sand. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his own soul? You know the story, he's sold into slavery, but God blesses Joseph. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 3, when his master saw, because he saw what was going on, saw that the Lord was with him and made him prosper in all that he did, Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his whole household and entrusted him with everything he owned. Days go by, things change, don't they? Some days are good, some days are bad. God gives rain to the wicked and the righteous both. But thank goodness for the rain, because without the rain our crops wouldn't grow, right? He gives sun to the wicked and the righteous. And to those who believe in His S-O-N, He gives eternal life. He gives them the right to be called children of God. <clears throat> Let me remind you again, verse, 1 Peter 3.15, But in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with, with gentleness and respect. How many times was Joseph telling others about his God? Oh, but that verse starts out with a but, so we need to go back to the previous verse. But, oh, that one starts out with a but too, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, let's look at 14, then we'll go back to 13. But even if you should suffer for what is doing right, you are blessed. Oh, that was Joseph, wasn't it? Do not fear what they fear. Do not be shaken. Okay, let's go back to 13 since there was a button 14. Who can harm you if you're zealous for what is good? I wonder if Joseph heard God speaking these words to him years and years before Peter ever wrote them to the church because he sure did pattern his life after a man who feared God and didn't worry about men, didn't even hold a grudge against his brothers who sold him off into slavery, but instead wanted to honor God with his life. But temptation comes, don't, doesn't it? And this man of God held to the temptation, and it cost him. And he gets thrown into prison. Genesis chapter 40, the baker and the cupbearer get thrown into prison also. Joseph interprets their dreams. A cupbearer is restored to the king's service, and the baker is killed. But the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph. He promised that he would tell the story because he saw the godliness in Joseph. But he left him there in prison, didn't he? Now, I had to think about this, and maybe you thought about it, maybe you didn't. But I had to think about cupbearer. Let's see, he was the one that brought the wine because the king drank wine as a celebration and that even goes to, to Jesus' first miracle or first sign that John says that he turned the water into wine. This celebration it will always continue because the king of all kings and lord of the lords is here in the flesh, not Pharaoh who thought he was a king and a god. And this was the guy that brought him his wine and made sure that it wasn't poisoned. He protected his king and gave his allegiance to the king. Because king had many, or Pharaoh had many enemies, and if you're going to get them, one way might be to poison the wine. So he literally would lay down his life for his king by tasting the wine. I don't know what happened, why he got thrown into prison, but the baker is the same way. He brought bread. Ooh, we have wine and bread, don't we? He brought bread to the king, and he made sure that it was all right. And he tr the king trusted him with his life because the, the baker would make sure there was no poison in the bread, and he brought him the food that he needed. So he had the bread and the wine to celebrate and run his kingdom. All because he's Pharaoh. No, all because God put you in this place to provide for his people, 
just as he said he would, because God is in complete and sovereign control. And then it takes me to the night when Jesus eagerly wanted to eat the meal with his disciples. And he laid out the cup, and he broke bread, and he said, this is my blood poured out for you, and this is my body given for you. Wow, Jesus is enough. Lord, help me to not focus on the things of this world, not to be complacent, but to eagerly give up my life, even sacrificing which is pleasing to you, to proclaim the gospel message, to love you with all of my heart, and to love my neighbor. Stand firm in your faith as you see Joseph doing. Genesis chapter 41. Hardships and testing lead to righteousness. If you can stand those temptations, if you can follow through, and you can't on your own, you have to with the Holy Spirit guiding you and leading you. Joseph becomes the second in command of all of Egypt, the kingdoms of the world, so that God can bless and grow the nation that he promised to Joseph's dad, Jacob, to his dad, Isaac, to his dad, Abraham. And I'll remind you again that Joseph's name means God will give God has added, or God, ha God will increase. So where is your faith? So a famine begins, and it's all over the whole known world. Without bread, especially the bread of life, without physical bread, we will die physically. Without the spiritual bread, Jesus is the bread of life. I am the bread of life. We will die spiritually. And a famine is there. And the nation of Israel, Jacob's family, has to go buy bread to live and buy it from Egypt. Genesis chapter 42. Joseph's brothers, these are the ones who sold him, remember, go to Egypt and Joseph recognizes them. Okay, I'm stopping to think what my reaction would have been, what my heart would have been when my brothers showed up. And I have to admit, they wouldn't have all been the best motives. He accuses them of being spies and throws them into prison. Some of you are, and I say that because, the first part, because some of the commentators say, oh yeah, he, he acted out fleshly before he realized, I don't believe that one. That's my thoughts. I believe Joseph, because he could interpret the dreams that God did, God gave him the discernment to lead his brothers to repentance. Because as you read on, you see that that's Joseph's motives. Sure, there might have been that first thought. Maybe you acted upon it, maybe you didn't. But Joseph is a man that's definitely focused on obeying God. His first pot, thoughts from Potiphar's wife came and tempted him, didn't seem to be fleshly at all. He seemed to be a man of integrity, a man of faith. <clears throat> So, ten of the brothers are released. Who's not released? Simeon, son number two. Remember, I already told you about his sin. And in verse 22 of verse 42, Reuben responded, there's son number one. Maybe he's drawing them to repentance. Didn't I tell you not to sin against this boy? But you would not listen. Now we must give account for his blood. I mean, even the pagans of this world realize they are without excuse, as you read back in Romans chapter 1, of the th evil things that they do. But the problem is, is the more you go down that path of sin, the harder it becomes because you go more into darkness and there's less and less light. We are children of the light. And the light will extinguish all darkness if you will allow it. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sins. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I don't see Joseph having to repent here. I see a story where a wise man is putting the fear of God instead of the fear of men 
into his brothers to draw them to repentance. Genesis chapter 43, Judah, now we're son number four, tells Jacob, uh, they're back home, and he tells Jacob or Israel, unless we take your now prized son, Benjamin, back with us, we are going to die because we need bread to live. As you're reading that, think about Romans again and how Jesus is the bread of life and you will die for all eternity if you do not know the bread of life. <clears throat> Jacob agrees, but he does the same thing he does with his brother Esau again. Let's send him a bunch of gifts. Let's let the gifts appease him instead of let God just take care and be God because he's promised us all this and he'll protect us. And they go to the prince of Egypt. But see, Joseph knows much more that he's a prince of the Most High King because he's a brother of Jesus. Even though Jesus has not been born yet, he's put his faith in Jesus. The Old Testaments are saved just like New Testament, even though they did not know the name Jesus. But now guess what? You know his name. So how are you living knowing that even more? That God loves you enough to die for you. Is Jesus enough? Genesis chapter 44, Judas repents, confesses his sins, and offers his life in place of Benjamin's, doesn't he? Genesis chapter 45, Joseph reveals himself. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves that you sold me into this place because it was to save lives that God sent me before you. Do not be distressed or angry. Do not let this bother you that you've sinned because I am forgiving you. If you come in repentance, you will be forgiven. God will multiply, God will forgive, God will increase us. But it's so easy to not ask for forgiveness, to fall back into that path of unrighteousness. And in verse 24, Joseph even says this as they head back. Don't quarrel along the way. Oh yeah, jealousy and quarreling and covetousness led us to this in the first place because we desired in our heart to kill our brother. We're back to Cain and uh, Abel already in this story. We continue to fall back in our sins. But God used what you did out of the wickedness of your heart to show you how righteous and faithful and loving He is. Genesis chapter 46, the nation of Israel, which numbers 70 now, and there's shepherds, they arrive in Egypt. Now Jacob can die in peace. He sees that God will do exactly what he promises. His son is still alive, and God is providing for them in this famine. He's brought his family back together. Genesis 47, the famine continues and Israel prospers and grows in spite of those conditions. Genesis 48, Jacob blesses Joseph's two sons, but what does he do? He crosses his arms when he blesses them. <laughs> this deceiving, he's right back to again. But God uses it. God's in control of it all the time. He uses the Pharaoh that will come up in Egypt that has forgot all about Joseph to show his mighty wonders to the world. But you have to decide if you're going to accept them and if you're going to accept them if you're going to pattern your life after them. Because you can profess with your lips all day long but your heart be far from the Lord. And he calls those wicked people and they will die in their wickedness. You can't put God in a box either. He does what he desires. Joseph was upset that his father did that. But as exactly as God knew that it would happen, ordained that it would happen, whatever words you want to say, even in Jacob's deception or not deception, do you trust God even when the blessings that are coming don't seem like the blessings that you thought they would be? Will you accept his blessings and know that he pours out blessings? Oh, I have a child. And if he would only realize that everything I do is for his benefit, that I love him so much that I would die for him, and I have a father that feels the same way about his son, and their love, my love, my dad's love, 
are nothing compared to my heavenly Father who wants to bless me and do good for me in spite of my sins. There's no sin that I've done that my father, earthly father doesn't love me for. He loves me. And my heavenly Father loves me so much more. Can I not see that for the fact that He would give His one and only Son? How can I continue to live this life that is a life not of faith? Man, I need to look at the example of Joseph. Genesis chapter 49. God forgives, but it doesn't mean that we don't have to live with consequences, does it? Chapter, verse 2. Come together and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Uncontrolled as the waters, you will no longer excel. Because you went up to your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. May I never enter their council. May I never join their assembly. For they kill men in their anger and hamstring oxen on a whim. Cursed be their anger, for it is strong, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And be looking for that as you continue to read, because it will happen. What about Judah? I'm leaving it up for you to go on and read that. But Judah is the one that repented and offered his life for his brother Benjamin a little bit ago. Maybe that repentance didn't lead to a blessing that was not so good at this point. I don't know. What I know is this story teaches me that I need to walk by faith. And a man who walks by faith leads a righteous life because he walks by faith so that the world sees his good deeds and asks him why he has the hope that he has. I do know this. God loves me so so much that Jesus is enough. Genesis chapter 50, Jacob dies. The brothers start to fear Joseph. Verse 19, but Joseph replied, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? As for you, what you intended against me for evil, God intended for good in order to accomplish a day like this. And that day is to preserve the lives of many people. Therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and for your little ones. And the chapter closes with the death of Joseph. That's the book of beginnings. The beginning of our story. Of God calling people. Has He called you? Have you responded to that call? Have you repented of your sins? Do you eat the bread of life and drink the covenant blood of Jesus Christ that you are saved, that you are His? Is the Holy Spirit live inside of you and is the Holy Spirit changing you to be like Christ more and more in this world? And all of us have room to grow spiritually, to mature. Romans chapter 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. If you read on, verse 9, Love must be sincere. Detest what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Man, I had, I had to go back and read some of what Joseph did. Outdo yourselves in honoring one another. Do not let your zeal subside. Keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Persistence in prayer. Now I'm going back reading it again. And I know how much Joseph must have prayed day in, day night in that dark dungeon that didn't seem to have any light. I think about Paul writing to the Philippians while he's in jail, telling them that his sufferings while he's in chains was to benefit not only them, but to benefit the guard that he's witnessing to. So I can see how much Joseph is witnessing there. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice for those who rejoice. With those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but enjoy the company of the lowly. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Carefully consider what is right in the eyes of everybody. 
If it is possible, own your part, live at peace with everyone. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give them drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Wow. I am so thankful that in this history of mankind, which is his story, God's story, that there's light and hope of Joseph. Going on to Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. It's what Merle read us this morning. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. For your salvation is nearer the now than you first believed. The night is nearly over. The day has drawn near. So let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision, none, for the desires of your flesh. So what do I do each and every day, taking this from that verse? Oh, yeah. <laughs> After I sleep, I wake up. Right? When I wake up, I open my eyes and there is light, not darkness. I mean, sure, there might be a little dark in your room, but there's some light usually and you can turn on the light. There is light. Am I fixing my eyes on the light? Or am I still groping around in the darkness? No, I am not groping around in the darkness. I am light, following the light. So then what do I do? I dress myself. Oh, and the spiritual applications of that, just as much as physical. And I consider what needs to be done for the day. And then I go do it. Aren't we more than just flesh and blood? Aren't we spiritual beings in an earthly tent? And don't we long for our home in heaven? Being transformed, whatever that means to you, whatever you fathom it to be, but transformed like Jesus? Where there is no sin, there is no death, every tear will be wiped away. So when I wake up and open my eyes, do I open them to the light of Jesus Christ? Do I dress myself with His robes of righteousness? Do I consider what I need to do for Him? And then go, do, I, do I go do it? Or do I just fix my eyes on earthly things? Romans 14, verses 12 and 13. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop judging one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Romans 15, verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 16, verse 25, to the end of Romans, Now to Him who is able to strengthen you by my gospel and by my proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery concealed for ages past, but now revealed and made known through the writings of the prophets, by the command of the eternal God in order to lead all nations to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. If Jesus died to save men, am I living like Jesus? Or am I living with my eyes fixed on the things of this world? Are you born again? Am I born again? Is my new name Christian? Like Christ, then am I walking by faith as a child of God, a foreigner in this world, pointing people to the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ, my Savior and my Lord? The world, even the kings and gods of this world, will see God. But I am called to be a light. I am called to take my part. It is a privilege and an honor to be a priest who offers spiritual sacrifices pleasing to God. It is a holy position that God has given us. How lightly do we take it? In Genesis 41 verse 45, Pharaoh saw God and Joseph. 
And he gave him an Egyptian name that proclaimed to the world who God was. I don't know if you caught that. You wouldn't have unless you studied what the words mean, and I will butcher it. Zathanath Panahi. That's his name. Oh, remember Daniel had a different name and stuff too. But this name that Pharaoh gave Joseph was so that the nation of Israel would recognize this name of this Hebrew man of faith that was now the prince of Egypt. We don't know what the name means exactly, but you can gather several things from it. It means that God lives and provides all life. It means that God is in control. He knows everything and is sovereign in everything. This is the name that Pharaoh gave. And he reveals himself to those who put their faith in him. That's the name that the God of this world gave to Joseph because he saw God in Joseph. Yeah, because he could answer dreams, yes. But he had to see his integrity and his righteousness backed up the others what will your story say oh well let's look at the devotional and see if we can get us a little words of insight yeah I'm spurring you <laughs> January 21st was citizens of somewhere else <laughs> and it's Philippians 3 the one that Paul wrote while he was in jail to the Philippian church we're not from around here our citizenship is in heaven and when we live as aliens here, as people who don't belong, we'll make a difference in the world around us. We have daily opportunities to walk out into another day and be different, to be what we are, citizens of heaven, people who are not from around here. The Bible warns <coughs> that if we live to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, Hebrews 11:25 that eventually they'll eat us up and squeeze the life out of us. Instead, we are lived in, expectant, in expectation of future glory. If people suspect from your life and discover from your speech that you have a citizenship in heaven, that you serve a living God and that you're looking forward to going home where, you'll, where your life will be utterly transformed, then sooner or later some of them will ask you to give them a reason for the hope that is in you. 1 Peter 3.15, ironically, which we started our uh, Sunday school lesson with ironically last week. Are you telling others by the way that you live of the hope that is in you? Today is a day of opportunity for you to be different. How will you take that opportunity? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for your scripture, that your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, pierce deep within us to be the kind of men and women that you have called us out to be, to realize that we are supposed to be like Christ in this world, to realize that our lives have been purchased back from, from death to life, that we are supposed to shine like Jesus shines, that we to, to, to reflect Him because we are being transformed into Him every day that we read Your Word, that we allow Your Spirit to guide us each and every step along the way. Help us to walk in step by the Spirit. Increase our faith, Lord. Help us to be a people that are firmly tied together just like a human body that have a purpose and that purpose is to honor the head, Jesus Christ, and to serve them in this, in this world by being like Him. Lord, give us the words when we don't have the words to say. Help us not to miss the opportunities, Lord, but to be a light until Jesus Christ returns. And we pray this in His name. Amen.
Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know who I am believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed.